Hi guys. Um, I know everybody's looking to see what happened today, and generally speaking, if you've been involved, God, my eyes are so red. Um, you can probably tell that um, if you don't hear anything after a court appearance, it's usually bad news, and it's bad news today. And it's bad news in um, really big ways, too, that I don't even want to think about. When something's immediately finished in court, I just usually dwell on the the fact of, you know, how it went down and the legal arguments, and so I spend the first half day on that, and then for a couple of days it just gets really, sinks in, and, and I just get very distressed, so I'm anticipating that phase starting any second. I've been tweeting, if you're on Twitter and you look at um, Brindy's mom, at Brindy's mom, you'll see what I've been sort of randomly tweeting around the whole thing today, not not really telling the whole story, but... I tried to make a video earlier and I was sort of rambling. I'm just, I, I would like to just get it across to you that um, basically, and I have to say, I think, I think generally speaking, I was fairly well prepared today, maybe more or a little bit better than before, but um, it was just another, another rut. I mean, the, the uh, city seems to enjoy um, unquestioning acceptance in courts with whatever it says, and however far-fetched it is what they say. I, I don't know that I, I, I should post probably their their brief. I always find them very, um, uh, how should I put it, you know, kind of offensive actually, because they their reasoning is sort of insulting. Things like saying that, you know, all through the trials they're going on about how I'm so irresponsible and this and that, and you know, it's just, and, but also trying to also double it you know, apply it to Brindy that she has to die, but, you know, in this brief they said something like, uh, if Francesca can't control Brindy, then who can? I mean, you know, what kind of reasoning is that? And control meaning what exactly, you know? I mean, I just can't get over this disjuncture between the actual harm done, which is minimal by any standard, and, and this, you know, extreme reaction, extreme level of control and intervention and insistence on death without any, and I tried to say this again, again, without any expert opinion, okay, and all they've got are, are opinions by the lawyer who has no qualifications at all, and her, her knee-jerk, you know, assessments of dogs and their conduct, and Brindy, um, and they've got statements by people that work for HRM, like the animal control officer, who actually in her spare time reads dog behavior and is very up on things, like especially the same things that my trainer used and the same things my trainer put forward. But she would never say that on the stand. And today I was hoping to make her say something about it, but I didn't even get the chance. And the other one being the kennel owner who, uh, you know, ought to know better and nobody who also breeds and trains dogs like she does ought to be involved in keeping a dog for longer than even a month or so. I mean, I know, you know, the best kennel here doesn't want to do that at all. I mean, he, he felt badly because he had to take a dog for three months when a woman who was an airline hostess had to go away. And, you know, he told me all about that. This is way before they even took Brindy. So, you know, I'd like to know how that squares with their community. But uh, anyhow, this woman who's a kennel owner obviously has a financial interest and she's not likely to say anything in an affidavit of, of significance in terms of whether really it's a good idea to keep kenneling a dog. Now, I have a trainer and a vet and both contributed letters to the sentencing hearing months ago, and I use them now, and uh, they uh, are not getting even equal uh, consideration to what's being put forward by the city. And, you know, the thing that hit me when I came back was, like, this incredible amount of work to go to go through this, because you know, not only for me is it more because I'm not a lawyer, but because I am not, you know, I am filing a motion you guys have no idea what it means to file this motion, and this is not even going to be counting for the appeal. There's, you know, I had to go and get transcripts and pay for that, but I had to produce um, four separate documents from scratch. I mean, I could use some of the uh, attachments from before, but really I had to write um, a notice of motion, which is like five pages long. I don't see it here, but... And, um, and write an, a supporting affidavit with exhibits, you know, and I put I put things like this picture in and so on, and I had to write a brief uh, for the motion, which is another, like this is, um, 
how many pages, and, and that has exhibits and so on too, and get them bound and make three or four copies of each and file them and, you know, go back and forth. I put in pictures of the injuries. There's the injuries, you know, wow. Look at the size of the guy's fingernail. Look at the size of the actual wound, you know, and, and let's look at what we're really talking about here. But, you know, all I get are this preaching uh, response from judges going on about how, you know, they have to protect all the other dog owners and their dogs. Well, who's going to protect my dog? So she says, you know, this is just, I'm not able to hear the motion application because of jurisdiction. I don't have jurisdiction. She's a Supreme Court judge. I don't have jurisdiction. But she also is actually going into the, the arguments about the motion itself. She's not going just to talk about the legal constraints, which I think are, are being wrongly interpreted as well. But she's also been dipping over the line into the actual statements, you know, with regard to the fostering uh, request and then uh, taking them mainly from HRN. And, and when I would say, well, look, you know, you're, you're talking about the record that HRM or the history HRM is telling you about, I have issues with that. And she goes, yes, and they're going to come up in the appeal. Well, no, they should be heard. They should have been heard today. Because if she's going to bring them up at all as grounds for not, not hearing the motion, let alone, well, basically she was trying to say, you know, if I went ahead and heard the motion application, then you would not get it. And she was trying to, I think, you know, discourage that idea. But nevertheless, she was also um, applying a different standard to that, uh, to their statements than to mine and to my affidavit as well as the letters from those, uh, from the trainer and the vet. Now, I couldn't bring in the trainer and the vet into court. That requires subpoenaing them, uh, offering compensation, and so on. And neither one of them, as good as they are, I don't think it would be fair. And I, sh I really deep down believe it shouldn't be necessary. But anyhow, um, the vet would not want to leave her patients. We've talked about it many times, and I, I, I accept that. I, you know, even at the risk to Brindy, I can't do this. And these women have been very good to me and her. And you know, I appreciate it, and, uh, and neither one has asked for anything, any money for the extra time they devote to writing letters and so on, and uh, and talking to me and, and whatever. So, you know, and Susan Jordan didn't even ask for anything. I wanted to give her some money for her assessment of Brindy and so on and coming into court, but she won't accept it. So I, I tried to point out today, look, you're, you know, lady, which is what they call the Supreme Court. These are statements from people that have no financial interest, no, no chance, no prospect of financial gain at any point from this uh, versus people that are working for HRM and I think you know that needs to be considered and and also there are experts in in this subject and the people that work for HRM are not so you know this is an issue and at the very very end I, I just really you know it was sort of a discussion and I really tried to be assertive and, and but I couldn't uh, you know um, be as assertive as I would in a regular conversation because this is a Supreme Court justice. So if she decides, you know, she's making noises like she doesn't want to go a certain way, you cannot, uh, you know, be strong-arming her. You'll get nowhere and would be very inappropriate. So, I mean, I, I raise as many arguments and, and uh, rebuttals as I could under with those constraints, but... Um, and frankly, I do think I made some very good points, and I always come away thinking I didn't get to say this, I didn't, you know. But in the in the end, I think she just shied away from it because it, she felt like it was going to set a precedent. And even though we know that sometimes courts need to set precedents, I, I failed to convince her. Uh, I felt like though she was um, arguing with me, sort of like having a almost like she was taking a position of arguing against me when I was making my comments, but then when she asked the HRM lawyer to stand up, she was arguing with her, like kind of agreeing with her. So I didn't see that she was handling her in the same way, so of course I feel like, you know, she already had her mind made up, and even though it appeared at times where she was wavering, um, in the end I think she really didn't want to do it, and she was then actually coding it over, that decision not to hear the motion. With a with a way of like she was restating or, or describing uh, my situation where you know what happened before and how this is going ahead in an appeal and also uh, kind of paraphrasing the the trial judge's ruling about giving Brindy to the city and so on and how that happened and so on and she was getting it wrong I mean she was really spinning it and it wasn't accurate uh, th you know in terms of what how things were put to the tr trial judge and, you know, 
what her conclusions were in, in terms of what they applied to and what they didn't apply to. In other words, like she was applying them to the whole issue of um, indefinitely holding Brindy, which the trial judge explicitly said she wasn't going to consider that. She just kept putting it off and putting it off. So her, her ruling should have no bearing or it shouldn't be seen to have any bearing on the issue of, of that whether you know it was right to continue holding Brindy all this time and at the same time her decision to turn her over to the city uh, isn't really supposed to be in effect and so because this uh, decision is supposed to be suspended pending the appeal but this judge and the HRM lawyer agreeing with her you know they split it in half and they're saying well you know the judge only said we can't kill her now we have to wait till the appeal and you know in fact the judge didn't say kill her she said you decide what you're going to do with her but in any case no, part of her ruling was also to say, you now own this dog. Well, if the ruling is suspended, the whole ruling is suspended, and I tried to make this point, and at that juncture where the judge said, oh, come on, you know, but in other words, like, she sees that there's this ongoing momentum or whatever from the city always having control of her, which is what the city's encouraging her to think. We, we've had her all this time, therefore we have her. We must have a right to have her because we have her. We took her, we must have her. There's only a law saying they can take her if there's no law saying they can keep her and for how long or anything. And that's a really huge, I mean, if this were any other issue, this would be a, a major scandal in the law. Okay, If it was your car they were doing this with, you know, forget it. I, and they do impound cars for a long time, but they have reason and they have a law that allows it, you know, and specifically allows it and it specifically provides for ways to get it back and so on but not with dogs. So, you know, there's there are places that have, and I, I try to point this out, that have, and even Texas has a limit on how many days they can hold your dog, like it could be 14 days or 30 days or something, before, you know, they have to give it back or succeed in getting an order to put it down or whatever. And they're very important. And, you know, seized property is, is seized property, right? So you have property rights involved and you have a dog's life in right, involved. So those those uh, constraints are important to, to have in place. They don't care. They don't seem to be worried about it. And it's a shame because a Supreme Court judge by, you know, and today I was only asking for an interim motion as a temporary thing. She, she has the power that she kept denying she, she had. Uh, she kept claiming that she had to have a specific wording in some statute or something saying she can specifically make this interim order, you know, to, to foster a dog pending an appeal. Look, no, she doesn't need that at all. The, the law is very broad. I won't bore you with it, but I read it out of court. And, it, you know, there's the words, you know, and I'm not a stupid person. I'm not a genius, but I know how to understand the English language. And I succeeded pretty well in putting my finger on things, you know, from the beginning with the Supreme Court, you know, quashing things. They didn't even quash the ones, you know, my lawyer just didn't even go forward with the ones I wanted. And then afterwards said, oh, yeah, we could have quashed those too, you know. But anyhow, I think I can, can recognize these things, and uh, I hear them talking, and I'm looking at the words on the page, and they just don't match up. And uh, they were talking about it as, you know, oh, this is intended to apply only to civil cases, and so on. Well, this is not exactly a criminal case. Uh, it just gets grouped with it, but it's not really a criminal case. It's a summary conviction. Don't ask me to explain, but in any case... That seemed really weird to me because there's nothing saying that this does, this doesn't, you know, there's no little thing in the criminal code, which is it, it is in the criminal code, saying, P.S., this property seizure limit or whatever doesn't apply to summary convictions. And I don't know where they're getting this from, right? So that's a problem. And uh, I also think it's really um, strange that uh, the judge was saying that she had to have specific statutes letting her do something, but the city doesn't have it for holding my dog. And she's willing to, you know, just believe that they do or say that, you know, just kind of like, come on, you know, they should have, they, they have her and so on and why, you know, as if that's just understood. That's not good enough, you know, and um, it's it's a really huge problem and the, the repercussions are severe and now particularly severe because you have to all understand something. Um, I hope this is still taping. Anyway, that that, you know what, I've been telling individuals, but... I, and I don't get enough time to research, I also can't stomach it, but as much as I should. Um, appeals in Canada, in general, um, don't have a great success rate. They, uh, I think that the success rate is something like um, 20 to 25 percent, and that's, that's all kinds of appeals, okay? And that's mostly appeals that are put forward by lawyers. If you're representing yourself in court, 
in anything, you, you have a huge disadvantage. And it's a disadvantage that is partly due to not being familiar with it or not knowledgeable enough, but also because there is a prejudice against people representing themselves in court. And uh, it, it, you know, for some judges, they find it difficult. Others don't. Others are very patient and so on. But there's a temptation for both the judges and the prosecutors to take advantage of it as well. So, you know, um, it's difficult. Let's put it that way. It's just difficult. And I knew this all along, but I also knew, and it was confirmed for me, that, you know, for this judge to turn Brindy back over to the city obviously didn't leave her in secure hands. And they confirmed it by saying that they um, they didn't have any plans for assessing her as they were told to, uh, but when they did assess her, they were going to keep this, uh, the results secret. They didn't use the word secret; they kept saying internal, and insisted even that you know this is always what we do. Well, I said to them, you don't always do any assessments. So what are you talking about? In four years, you haven't done an assessment on Brindy. Clearly, it's not a customary thing. So to claim that this is our customary way of handling things is is completely bogus. And I could see through this and see that what they meant was, you know, they're going to keep what happens to Brindy's uh, secret as well. Because if they, if they wanted to keep the assessment secret, it wouldn't stay secret once people knew what they decided with Brindy, right? Obviously, if they decided to adopt her out, the uh, assessment was a good one. If they decided to put her down, it wasn't a good one, right? So, you know, but so why would they bother to try to conceal the assessment if they didn't also plan to conceal her fate? So they really forced me into uh, an appeal, uh, which I was probably going to do anyhow because there's there's lots of reasons, and because I want her back, and because you know I I just think this whole thing never should have happened. So, you know, and and I cannot. Uh, still and uh, you know get over the shock and and the continuing shock that they would then go after me and go you know look at the mess in this house and you know and and have absolutely no concern for my existence and my um shelter and welfare not only my dogs you know which by taking my dog they're already delivering a blow to me you know that's extremely devastating and they had no consideration for that but then when they turn around on a day like today and they tell a judge, you know, oh, well, she's happy in the cane you know, on the kennel. She's happy? You know, like, they're, don't confuse a dog that's, like, good-natured and gracious and cooperative with a happy dog. That's a whole different thing. And I can tell you that I've, you know, experienced the difference between Brindy in the kennel and Brindy at home. And there's, it's, there's nothing, you know, connecting them. Uh, she's just not who she is in the kennel as nice as they think she is, you know, she, she's a very nice dog, and she's a great dog, but the greatness, you know, can't really be, fo be fully there when she's kept in there, and, and the fact that she gets to see this family, this woman was talking about special privileges for her, including that she gets to see them through their windows of their house as visual stimulation, I'm thinking, are you kidding, that would just make a dog sad, and, and if not frustrated, you know, and especially dog like Brindy. So, you know, I found that, her, you know, it was hard for me to even read the kennel owner's affidavit. Anyway, so I, you know, I could share some other stuff, but, but uh, you know, I don't even like to look back at this brief from the city. It's, it's so obnoxious, and I never understood, you know, how how they could be accepted to by a, by a judge. I mean, the appellant who claims to be a responsible dog owner was unable to keep Brindy adequately under control. Adequately, for 20 seconds of, of a day, of a year, um, there can be no certainty that any foster home would be better able to do so. You know, logically, there's no certainty about anything, is there, right? But the fact is, you have to look, look at, you know, what's certain about any dog, or any owner, what's certain, and what's the responsibility of the city to, to make certain nothing. I mean, they, they really, you know, they talk about people have a right to walk down the street uh, without an attack on the dog. Well, well, you know, that's not actually a right as a, in the law, whereas there's other rights in the law that, that I've been denied a lot and every single day by them holding my property, you know, and so on. And then uh, denying me an appeal and so, you know, that's serious rights. And uh, when you get attacked, if your dog gets attacked and, it, and it's just your dog and another dog, that's about property and that's a civil matter and there's provisions for that, you know. That's not the obligation of the city to uh, to take action on at all. 
And uh, that's widely known and understood, but apparently not here, and they get away with this. So, you know, it's very strange. Um, and they keep saying she has aggressive tendencies, blah, blah, blah. You know, and uh, with no, to suddenly reintroduce a dog with aggressive tendencies into the community with no preparatory training or acclimatization would be extremely risky. Hello? You know what? We did the acclimatization the last time around. No problem, really. And also, you know, is, is that a reason to not let her go to a foster home? To just say that it would be extremely risky? And this is only the opinion of a lawyer. This is not the opinion of a vet or a trainer. And my vet and trainer, who, again, like they are as impartial as you can be because they're not paid or anything, they both think that there's no case to be made for continuing to keep her in the kennel. And they both say it's it's very um, debilitating and, you know, she might never rehabilitate if they continue to keep her and so on. And the health risks are mounting, you know, by the day, especially now because nobody looks in on her now. They won't take her to the vet now. So there's a really huge injustice going on here. And, I mean, they say they say there can be no guarantees. They say another thing about how... Well, they totally twist the, the record about people kicking Brindy and so on and, and attribute that to uh, holding her back from doing worse harm. Well, frankly, you know what? It had no effect one way or the other. She was either going to do a lot of harm or not. You know, a dog can move like, with lightning speed, and, you, you know, you're not going to stop them with a kick. I'm sorry. If she didn't inflict serious harm, it had nothing to do with the kick. It was because she didn't intend to. And so, you know, that seems very clear when you think about it, but people have these, you know, misconceptions that are really pretty strange, and, uh, and they seem too convenient to me. But um, they, they really are, are just, I mean, oh, and there's a place where they actually talk about injuries happening where there were none, and there was none established in court, and that really is shocking, and so on and so forth. But... You know, I'm sorry, I have no regard for people who engage in this kind of stuff, but apart from that, I, I need to worry about Brindy, you know, and the appeal scheduled for November 30th, but I need to have it moved because I need to have two full days. They only set one day down, and they did that before I knew when, when this motion or if I could make this motion. So if I were facing the choice of, you know, just pick the date or agree to the early, you know, it was going to have to be the earliest available, and the earliest available was just one day. And then the guy said, you can do this motion now. And so if I'd known that first, I would have said, let's get two days, and then if it has to be in February, so be it, you know, because I will fight. And that would have possibly helped, because today the judge kept saying, you only have to wait till November 30th, and so on. But I had already told her, you know, that I actually believe I need to get this uh, moved to, you know, so that I can get the first two days that are, avail are available, because I have too many things to do to appeal. I have to appeal the conviction and the motions with the, you know, before that and the sentence. So half a day is really not enough. That's only three hours and frankly it's just not enough to go through this including with constitutional issues and, and that's my best shot, you know, and it has to be complete. So I'm really torn now. In a way it might help her stay alive longer but it's a really bad place that she has to be there and, and I'm really angry. We're having a, a protest on Thursday called Enough is Enough at noon at City Hall. There's a little park in front of City Hall in Halifax. And I'm hoping we get at least, you know, 20 or 30 people. It would be great even more if we could just get out there and say, look, enough is enough. And Halifax needs to foster her now. She re they really need to let her go home now. But, you know, I didn't even ask. I mean, I, legitimately, I could have asked for her to be returned home pending appeal because all the d other dogs are left home, allowed to be at home pending a trial. You know, at the very least, they could let her be home pending an appeal, but no. But, you know, I thought I would scale it back and, and ask for a foster, and even that wouldn't happen. So, but, I mean, enough is enough that they, they still, if they're claiming that they, they get ownership already now, then they have the power to foster her, and they haven't produced anybody with any credibility saying she can't be fostered. I mean, just having it said by a lawyer, I'm sorry, that's not how things are done. And if I went in with a brief like this, they would laugh it out of the court. You know, you have to substantiate it. So, people, we need to really drum up some, you know, awareness and push people to get the hell out on the streets. And, and you know, it doesn't work with online petitions and it doesn't work with emails. We know that. It's been four years. So, you know, 
it's got to have some kind of material manifestation and, and, uh, and have some effect that way. It's no use to talk to politicians about it, I can tell you right now. They're, they can hide behind this, this division between the uh, judicial and the legislative branch. Now, they don't always do that, but when they choose, that's what they'll do. And they will choose to hide behind it. So that's not going to happen, okay? I can only try to make public the things I know about the kennel and the fact that they haven't had a business license for two years which I guess now they went and paid for one a couple of days ago, but they still are subjected to fines. And, and even if the province says, oh, that's okay, you know, we should still complain because they're government contractors and they should be operating lawfully, and they're not. And that is a bad reflection on Halifax for hiring this, this uh, kennel without clearing whether it's actually got a business license, you know. So, you know, if they're, why is it okay for them? to be operating illegally and, and avoid fines of $36,500 and uh, not okay for me, you know, to, to uh, be, you know, given a break on something here. And why is it okay that, you know, I have to pay for um, taxes that aren't even taxes that are just dumped into my account that, you know, makes me look like I'm behind in my taxes. Why is that okay? Why is it okay if the demolition order is issued legally and then in two different ways illegally and then rescinded a year later when I've already gone the step of actually, you know, building a, tr a crazy foundation as fast as I could. I mean, why? So uh, I don't think we should let them off the hook and I think we should demand that they, that they do something. Uh, and, but, you know, because it's so deeply offensive and it's really definitely harming Brindy, uh, there's, you know, it's just ridiculous and, and not just ridiculous, it's absurd and really very hateful that they do this. So um, I hope we can get some people out. Otherwise, I don't know what to say because I just, I, I have an immense amount of work to do for the appeal and I don't look forward to it. I really don't. And I really hate, I hate sitting foot in courthouses and I hate having to file something and I have to overcome that. And it's a lot of energy to overcome it before I can actually do it, you know. And then it takes a lot out of me after that, especially since you have to get past the, the revulsion and go into some kind of, you know, objective dis action, and then you go to court and you realize, yes, I knew they were not going to give me justice, you know. So uh, it's it's incredibly unfair. I mean, I just, I went in with, I don't think it's here, but, but yeah, I went in with this whole thing, um, all these files and everything today, and sometimes I went with more, but with all kinds of papers and, and the, um, I have to see it, and the, um, the transcripts from the other proceedings and so on. You know, and they're actually trying to, I mean, all they did, all they did was write one new affidavit that was like three pages long, and then they resubmitted things from before, including these all these court decisions, like the ones that I'm appealing. If I'm appealing them, I don't understand how they would be legitimate grounds for, you know, arguing against this motion. So, you know, this is part of the transcript. Actually, I don't have a full transcript from the first trial, but that's part of it. And we actually, I, I did a lot more work to, to dig down back into the files and establish what they were faking and what they were distorting in the past. And, the, and it's quite a bit. And uh, But I didn't get to put that forward today. I didn't get to cross-examine people. I didn't get to go further and really, you know, present what I had because the judge kept saying, oh, no, that's for the appeal or, you know, this is just about jurisdiction and so on. So. Uh, it's disappointing. I also was expecting to get interviewed by the CBC today, and um, that didn't happen. I, d I think the guy just got called to another story or something. And I haven't gone to the press about this. I need to probably write another press release. I sent out one for the protest on Thursday. But uh, there's another issue that tomorrow, if I want to go get a new date for the court, for the appeal, I may have to get up at, and get into town by 8.30, which, by the way, I'm probably never going to manage to do. But so it might be till next week or the week after that I can ask for a new date, which means the dates will be taken all the way into March or something, unless there's a cancellation. So it's very difficult, and I, I, I just can't stress enough, like, in so many ways, that this is so unnecessary and extreme. And at the same time, the lack of, of uh, concern in the public officials and in the public, partly because the public's so badly informed, and partly because there's just this kind of a, of a mindset, you know, and uh, it, it 
doesn't just apply to the dogs, and so you know it's a really unfortunate situation. And but it, but it a actually you know can change, and it has to. And I think there has to be some kind of unity among people from all over that are facing this, and uh, set up something different from what's there now. Because this is not BSL, it's not breed legislation. This is just bad animal control, and the the breed legislation abuse abuses that we hear about are really a product of bad animal control. They're, they're not just the BSL that's, that's causing the trouble. Because if you look closely at these cases, they're usually trying to label a dog dangerous in order to apply, you know, the full BSL power. Because uh, they usually, these laws usually allow for dogs to sti stick around, you know, with or without muzzles. So, uh, but the law here, I mean, it just, it's not only the law is bad, but actually they made up a law, and then they then they just made decisions that that exploited the gap in legislation, and they continue to do that. and And I don't think uh, people get that at all. So you know, I try, um, but I'm pretty worn out, and I just you know, I can't really kick myself today because I think I did as well as I could, and you know, it's not perfect, but I did as well as I could. And I may have, you know, if I were a real lawyer, I might have been more facile, more able to really structure it and anticipate it. But it's pretty hard. Like, I don't even know going into a courtroom how things will unfold. Like, how much, what kind of a dialogue it will be, or if it, there's a dialogue at all, you know, uh, where there's a back and forth, like today. Uh, when I tried to get an injunction, the guy just said, you tell me now, you know, why I have jurisdiction. I speak for five minutes or something, and he just turned around and said, I don't have it, you know, interesting what you said, but I guess what, I don't think I have it, end of story, and you're out of here, you know, and that was that. So, I mean, it's it's a pretty tough situation. So I only pray that, you know, Brindy's doing okay. I, I just, I can't believe it. I said to them, to this court today, you know what, nobody's been allowed to go in there. They won't let the trainer vis visitor there. They won't let the vet visitor there. I don't get to visit her there. We're just taking the word for, of this woman, and this is a woman who hasn't been paying her, her, you know, $65 business license, which is nevertheless, it's illegal, you know? So, I mean, what are we doing here? You know, what are we doing? So now they don't want to take her to the vet every month, and they say it's unnecessary, but you know what? It's it's not their decision. It's the vet's decision, and, and that vet, you know, her vet decided, that, yes, it was called for because of her chronic conditions and so on. They're not concerned about liability. They, they would be just delighted if she died, you know. And so, you know, they, they figure I'm so worn out that I wouldn't be able to sue them. And they're, they might be right, frankly. I mean, I already have a lawsuit on file. I haven't been able to, to resuscitate and get going. And I, and I have another problem trying to protect my house. So, so they're, you know, they're betting, uh, you know, on the odds. And, and that's the way they operate, you know. They don't go back and, and fix things. They just keep going forward. So... I don't know. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I hope you guys are okay, and I thank you for everything and for your support, and I just uh, I apologize for being late with this. I hope this is something that maybe works. I don't know. But, um, you know, we just have to keep going, and uh, uh, I, I just know, you know, my career is pretty much <laughs> over, and I spent most of my life preparing for my career and sacrificing for my career and with this one asinine decision of uh, uh, Laurie Scalero and uh, Tim Hamm and, and probably Andrew McDonald, uh, people who probably never got very far in their career and their education or whatever, you know, good for them, but uh, sorry, you know, what you did is causing tremendous damage to a decent animal and a decent person and uh, that's really wrong. But they get protected. They're in a public servant position, and the entire public service position, rather, entire apparatus around them, you know, surrounds them, protects them, and allows them to continue. And that's not the way things are supposed to work in a democracy. But you know, I realize that democracies aren't what they're supposed to be these days. Nevertheless, this is about a dog, and you know, she's not a mouse, and she's not a, you know. Um, a bench or something. She she has a right, and uh, and she's only got rights through me. And if they violate my rights, then they're violating hers even more. And this is what the whole thing is about. And uh, giving her rights isn't going to happen. It wouldn't work. It's got to be that we stand up for our own rights and insist that this these are you know the same rights apply that apply to everybody else. 
Shadow's owner out in Okanagan said the same thing to me, you know, and I think they did really well because they had public pressure uh, to uh, to force their city to drop the charges and let the dog go, and even more, they got reimbursed for a lot of big chunk of their legal costs, you know, and the trial was just halfway through at that point, and they pressured them, and it worked. And uh, that they have the press to thank because they did a very good job reporting the actual facts in full, like in other words, you know, really describing things as they were happening. And you know, this press here has never really specified for people what exactly happened in these, all these attacks. They just talk about attacks, and they keep applying the the yardstick of number versus like the nature or severity of attacks. And I think that's a, a very backwards. Um, situation here too and that's across the board my, my trainer is very adamant about that she did